Okay, welcome back. We are still learning from Rousseau and today we are trying to paint ocelots. So again, I'm using Minicam to set up my page so you can see the painting, the reference photos and my palette cam. And uh, yeah, we have the space round about my guitar, uh, which I've decided uh, should be the stage in those blackened areas, either side of the guitar, to place some ocelots. Uh, if you look at my mix, I'm still using yellow ochre. I've still got um, diox purple inside my water and water soluble um, linseed oil and now um, two ocelot reference photos were needed because I liked one for the patterning uh, and I liked that the one on the right hand side for the stance it was a nice kind of coffee table stance nice and square and so I thought I would go in uh, with that the yellow ochre has been affected by the titanium white, which is already on the palette. And so there's a fairly good match between the colours going down and the colours of the ocelot on the right hand side. So basically what I'm doing is I'm blocking in a kind of stick figure for this ocelot. And I'm using a Rosemary & Co. Ivory uh, short flat brush. So once the straight lines go in for the stick figure, uh, I'm kind of blocking in some um, basic shapes that resemble the cat. right the way down to the forearm on the front side creating a triangle there so you can see a triangle for the haunch and you've got a triangle for the upper four limbs and now here what i'm doing is i'm suggesting where the back leg might be um, um, retreating backwards to suggest that the cat is in motion it's been walking, but suddenly it's come to a halt. I wanted to lengthen the spine of the um, cat there, um, just to try and get the proportions a little bit more clear. So, and all I'm doing here is I'm painting in the bits that don't have white. And the white I will be eventually using is not pure titanium white but um, uh, it's kind of been dulled with some mauves and things. Here I'm reversing my paintbrush to use it as a scribe to draw in some details and some reminders to myself about where separations are, where some facial details are for the eyes and things, such, such like. So the cat has mostly been blocked in apart from the fight. A quick change of brush into my mix, back into the yellow ochre, trying to darken it a little bit. There we are, trying to get the mix right as well, get the consistency because that's really important. And now the second figure has to come from my imagination. So I'm creating a stick figure because I want this cat to engage with the guitar. Now a guitar does not feature anywhere that I can see in Rousseau's output. It's just that I want to create a segue between the art that I've typically been doing for the last little while in my elasomorph paintings and I want to create a bridge between that uh, and this Rousseau painting. 
so I don't want to forget who I am as an artist. Uh, because in those Elasimorph paintings, I've been using Costa Rican wildlife to engage with uh, guitars and other um, personal symbols. So again, here what I'm doing, I'm um, creating a stick figure cat with a triangular head. And to create some shading there, I just allowed the, the paint to wear off the brush and drag it dry brush into the dark area. And so what that does is it's a, it creates a kind of shading effect. Um, it's something I use later on the blue figure to the left. But just now we're concentrating on the cats. So the haunch there is getting some lost somewhere into the greenery on the ground. But you can see as the paint dries up and merges um, with the black, you get some nice uh, tra um, transitions uh, of tints and tones. So back into my mix. I've spoken about how we use um, you know, a dirted mix to help uh, dull down or desaturate the colours. And here, you know, the diox purple uh, is a common thread in the painting. I've used it to temper a lot of my colours, including that elephant in the background. So you can see there's a lilac bias to that elephant in the background. So, titanium white, but it's been modified by other colours. Uh, I'm now tackling the white under the neck and down the chest to the forearms of the cat. It's already, in my opinion, a little bit too strong, so I'd want to dull that down with a little bit of lilac. Down to the forearm of the left uh, forelimb. Front and back, because if you see between the spots, there's uh, light detailing over the shoulder blade there and coming down to the underside of that left forelimb. So the yellow is sort of encased between two kind of white tram lines. And again on the right forelimb. And I lengthen that line to um, correct the drawing. And now the underside of the belly. Got to be careful not to go too far down because we'll damage the proportions and make the cat quite chubby. And we don't want that. Yeah, I can see from the cross uh, reference from the photo and my painting that the cat could have been a little bit longer. Never mind. Painting the light insides of the ear. And some little um, muzzle details. These were just created out of two little um, uh, circular discs. The white uh, merges with the yellow ochre a little bit. Uh, to give a kind of softer transitioning. And there's a light patch to the underside of that leg. So we create um, detail between the um, the leg nearer us and the rear leg disappearing behind the guitar. And it also brings the guitar into relief a little bit more. There's some lights on the forehead uh, of the ocelot is particularly nice. It's um, a very nicely patterned uh, cat. Lots of variation within the species, so as you can see between the two photos, right and left, that the colouring is different and the spot pattern uh, is um, uh, quite noticeably different. So the light eyebrows being painted in. And uh, a thing that I notice about Henri Rousseau's um, jungles is the animals don't appear to be fierce. I mean, they're going about their daily business, 
like for instance this cat that I'm painting right now wants to get at the bird which is going to be nesting inside that sound hole and uh, that's something that I've used as a motif in my own artwork um, and so yeah it wants to go about its business of causing harm to bird life and catching and killing but it seems to do it in a friendly and forgivable way so um yeah in Rousseau's uh, jungles there doesn't seem to be the sense of imminent harm or danger uh, the sense of nature red and tooth and claw it's a much more kind of um yeah forgivable um world that he creates and so I try and do that myself. The light helps to um, create shape and form. Now this was a tricky bit here, trying to get the paw to come round over the shoulder or the upper bout of the guitar as it's known. And I need the light paws on the left um, four limb which is grabbing towards the sound hole and also uh, lightening up the underbelly to uh, help throw the guitar into relief. Now later on that guitar is going to be lightened still but done in such a way that the difference between the cat and the guitar is still noticeable um, but for now it just helps to separate out the, um, the cat from the, from the guitar. So as I've said already, I'm using Windsor and Newton Artisan Water Mixable Oils and I'm using um, their uh, water soluble uh, linseed oil as a 50-50 mix with water. And here this white is being used to blend in. This is now one of the joys of uh, working in oils that um, I was told, but hadn't experienced for myself, the joy of just having um, the open working time that you get with working with oils. And so I can let the white be used up. As I work my way up the fur, I create um, transitions, try to suggest the form of the creature and also kind of modulate the color of the um, undertone of the cat, um, which is reflected in the right hand photo above. You can see areas where it's lighter, where the, you know, the undertone is lighter or darker. And so I'm trying to build that in, knowing that the complexity is going to be increased when I add the uh, dark dots which is um, uh, coming up fairly soon so yeah, that mix is coming in nice there's a nice transition between the dark ridge of the back the light of the flank going to the lightest part of the underbelly and so yeah that works The white um, isn't pure white, it is solid with the addition of diox uh, purple, which is, um, you know, purple and yellow are complementary colours on the colour wheel. And so um, even with the small addition of uh, diox purple from my medium mix, that has a, a nice dampening effect on the colour that the yellow ochre is not too abrasive to look at. And now I'm working over the left uh, haunch, um, trying to get the illusion of roundness on that um, uh, thigh.
Now, I know that the addition of black, carbon black, into uh, yellow ochre creates an olive mix. So I'm making an olive mix here, which will be the dark to um, cast the shadow area or round off some tradition um, transitions on the form. So here uh, we've got a little shadow area between the thigh and the underbelly on the left flank. And so I feel that I need a little bit more of the yellow ochre and a lot more of the carbon black to nudge it to a darker version of that olive. There is even a hint of umber because we want it warmed up a little bit. There's some diox purple going in to neutralize it, to dampen it down even further. So there's some uh, use of the color wheel. So working on a shadow area. So the right forelimb, which is away from us as we view the ocelot, is darker. And so this mix that I've created creates a kind of version of the sandy color which is dulled and greyed a little bit uh, by the inclusion of carbon black, um, a bit of diox purple and some of the raw umber. And these feet are going to get lost in the grass later on, so there's some shading going in there. But to all intents and purposes, that's an olive colour that's being used to uh, cast a little bit of shadow on that forelimb. Again, back into the mix, a lot more carbon black. Because there is a deeper shadow here on that thigh and the inside of that left flank. It has to be a little bit darker in my experience because the paint layer that's on is still wet. So uh, I am atypically working wet and wet, trying to paint this cat a la prima, so to speak. So wet paint is going on top of wet paint, and we call that working wet and wet. So, and that's an ideal way of, you know, creating an image at one go. So in one attempt is a la prima. So the carbon black is getting a bit of a workout here. Yep, the darkest version because we need to add in the nose and the eyes for both cats, I wonder. And the striations, I think, for the head and the shaded area of the ears. So, there we go. A lot more of the water and um, oil uh, mixture to work fat on lean. But also to get the mix right so that it, it flows a little bit better. So linseed oil uh, so linseed oil helps it to flow but what I've noticed about my painting um, style with my kind of stop and start is I have to keep track I have to have a really good memory of uh, where in the fat over lean process um, each part of the painting is because they're worked on in um, well when I'm able to for health and concentration reasons. Um, we've got to maintain this fat over lean principle. And so um, that has become a little bit of a difficulty, trying to keep track of where everything is. There's a tear duct on the eyes there, which creates a little triangle. And those uh, creases which are quite distinctive on the ocelot. If you look at the photos, they have kind of um, 
goalposts for um, a kind of crease or frown on their forehead. And this dark mixture is being used to show in the shoulder blades of the forelimbs, create some shadow area there. And an even darker version of this mix is going to be used to um, create the spots and dots and patterning. So from nothing, this cat has uh, come along a long way in a short while. And so the spotting uh, begins. I'm not making a copy of my reference photo, I'm just using them to um, help inform some of my decision making. It became clear as my spots and dots went along that I mustn't be uh, regular or mathematical because that's quite noticeable. You get into a kind of rhythm and it becomes um, too uh, predictable, too organised. So the idea is to make it as random as possible. But I did want to have a ridge along the spine there. And that also helps to set the cat into the darkness of that space there. So it's no longer sitting on top of the black. It seems to be merging in with it a little bit better. The black on the black background can be used as a sort of um, negative tipex. So you can also correct outlines and things that are not quite right. Like for instance, if the underbelly hangs a little bit too low, you can correct that a little bit. So this is altogether a new experience for me working wet and wet with oil paint. And I must say I found it very different, but very satisfying as well. Knowing that I could just move shapes around and correct them and just basically draw with the paint. What I learned quickly though was um, I was quite happy with uh, making spots and dots which were on the diagonal. And so that is something that I learn. I also noticed that on the haunch, some of these spots and dots were a lot bigger. So I tried to vary the frequency, um, the size, the intensity of the pattern in a given area. And just try and make sure that it's not too regular, that it's random enough to be plausible. and down onto the legs as well. So. Now, in terms of copying the uh, original painting by Rousseau, he uses lines, so we've changed them to ocelots to suit my family's um, you know, particular interests and peccadillos. Um, but in the painting by Rousseau, the dream from 1910. He has got two cats. One is looking straight out at the viewer and the other one is looking towards the figure. So uh, I tried to have this, but in this version, the cat is interested, the one that I'm painting right now, the ocelot seems to be, um, uh, its direction of intention, for want of a better expression, is towards the female reclining figure. And the other cat, which should be looking out towards the viewer, is preoccupied with whatever it is that's going to come out from that sound hole. Um, in the end, what happened was um, uh, I'm a member of Costa Rica uh, Wildlife um, Facebook page. So I got an update on a particular bird, which is called an Oropendula and has decided that should emerge from the guitar soon. Uh, back to the ocelot. Once the diagonal black patterning was um, increased, and I did some after you know filming stopped, so I made alterations, I went in with some random white dots. Again, it's not pure white from the tube, it's tempered with the kind of lilac that we've got from the diox mix. 
but again that creates a kind of sheen on the fur and makes it a little bit more visually interesting, gives it a little bit of pop because we have um, a greater range of tones there. We've got quite dark darks, some uh, range of mid-tones and our lightest lights uh, are all needed to bring that um, ocelot to life. And if you compare it with the uh, cat on the right hand side, um, you know, you can just see that it's a lot more believable, it's more plausible, it's, you know, more fully there, it's, it's got more presence, really. Could I do more? Yes. And uh, later on, I do try and scratch in some fur uh, with my preferred um, scrofito technique. But here what I'm doing is I'm using the dark to dot all over the body of the second ocelot, but also to outline some of the details. The paw on the shoulder of the guitar um, to our left, um, it doesn't seem to be sitting on, so we need a little bit of a cast shadow there. And the arms stretching over its left four limb reaching towards the sound hole of the guitar is kind of lost so it needs to be highlighted without outlining because um, while friendly we don't want this to appear like a cartoon. Uh, I am taking this image seriously as I attempt to paint in you know Rousseau's naive style. Childlike yes but informed by um, you know, an adult intelligence. Now, some of that outlining is aided by the presence of dots. So, by um, a little bit of judicious um, positioning, um, you know, some of the problems were solved there. But ultimately, the guitar soundboard was um, uh, painted and with such a light colour that um, it throws the other colours into relief. Now, having done all the black spots and dots, I'm now lightening, going in with my lightest light to uh, create a little bit more form. And I seem to notice that this one, having practiced on the first ocelot, the second ocelot seems to have taken shape a lot more speedily. Um, and I suppose if you build up a painting habit, you get to know uh, how to use your how to use your paints and you will get um, you will kind of speed up. I used to paint incredibly fast using acrylics that was my preferred medium but now um, yeah these um, water soluble oils have a lot to commend themselves. I am converted having been uh, quite a, a skeptic and a bit of a philistine about them. It seems to me that this part of the painting is uh, coming to an end fairly soon. On the palette you can see that I've gone into some of that tempered uh, titanium white, back into the carbon black, and guess what? We are working on the sound hole to create depth but the grey is going to be the underpainting for the Oropendula. Now the thing about the Oropendula is it's got a lovely beak, but it's got a kind of um, bony disc which stretches out so that the, the beak uh, continues upward over the forehead and creates this kind of shield, a bit like a coot. But whereas... Uh, a coot is definitely a marsh or a water bird. The Oropendula is definitely a forest and it's a perching bird. So, um, yeah. We have to give the cat something to play with and here it is. So having gone in with a grey, I'm trying to draw now with a darker value um, the shape of this bird's head. And if I remember correctly, the sound hole had to be enlarged to accommodate this bird. 
Also, the sound hole was darkened behind the head to throw the head forward and into uh, relief. So, um, yeah, by working on the negative space, you throw the positive form, which is the head of the bird, uh, into direct contrast and into relief. It throws it forward so we can see it a lot more easily. But here, all I'm doing is uh, painting quite tentatively, trying to figure out how the shape relates to everything else that's going on round about it. So, short strokes, tentative moves, slow progression, and basically just trying to feel out how the composition's um, going to work. But again, this is a, another feature of my other art. So I'm trying to, like I say, create a bridge, a segue between uh, Rousseau's painting style and that of my own. Um, I want to learn from what Rousseau does, but I don't want to lose sight of who I am. So here is the beak going in and that light dollop, which I first created, is that kind of coot shield on the forehead. Now there's several species of Aropandula uh, and some of them have a lovely chocolatey brown um, uh, nape you know, on their neck and the beak has a kind of bluish cast to it which um, I think might be useful even at this later date, because I'm doing the voice over in retrospect, um, I haven't blued that particular part of the beak yet because I'm undecided. And I am aware that, you know, there are sometimes, because I'm thinking out loud, I'm speculating about the artwork, I think that one idea will work and then later on I don't carry it out. This is true of the the blue figure, the female figure reclining on the seat. I wanted to make her black, um, um, but that wasn't going to work. And I realized that if that figure was black, I couldn't get away with um, the couch being so light. There wouldn't have been enough of a contrast. I thought about keeping the figure blue and just rendering it more fully because that means I could have still a fairly light uh, couch and this blue figure would still pop forward. But in the end, I had to uh, resort to a white figure on that um, uh, lounger. There, some white going in for the eye. Again, building up the brightness of that shield, creating the shape of the beak correcting the drawing by lengthening the beak. You'll see that uh, just happening just now, just extending the beak to the correct um, amount. And the thing about this oil, oil painting uh, business is you can, you know, set stuff down knowing that you can rework it later. You can push it around. You can push the paint around a little bit. So, which is something that I do with the um, the eye of the Ropendula. I've just got a white dot to start off with, knowing that I can scrape out the middle material and that will make a disc, which is an eye ring for the bird. And I can draw in other kind of details and things using the scrofito. So, if you look at the catalogues uh, for, say, the Society for All Artists, that's the saa.co.uk, or even Rosemary & Co., you can see um, paint shapers. So these are kind of rubberized tip, kind of silicon tipped uh, brushes. Um, but instead of having hairs on the brush, they just have a silicon tip. And these are shaped in such a way that you can make marks into um, uh, previously applied paint. Um, so that brings this um, artwork to a conclusion. That's this episode done. The ocelots are now 
where they are. A little bit of work was continued after uh, filming. And the next thing that we're going to look at is the flowers. Um, Rousseau paints his flowers in a particular way and we tried to uh, learn from that and try and incorporate them into our artwork to improve the composition. Thank you for viewing. I hope you find something of interest that will inform your own creativity wherever you are. Thank you for watching this one. Hope to see you in the next one.